Hello, and welcome to Crafting a Revolution, the podcast. My name is Katie Freeman, and I am your host. I bring you interviews of female and non-binary makers of all kinds from all over the world every Wednesday and Friday. And this week's guest is Kelly of Sally Forth Supply. Um, Kelly is maybe a maker of a different kind than I've had at least recently on the podcast. Um, and really, she's kind of a Jane of all trades because she has done all kinds of different making, um, but she's really into sewing and uh, kind of leather work and sewing. So like I said, it's been a while since I've had, um, you know, a maker similar to Kelly on, but excited to bring her on and get to learn all about her story and share that with you. Before we hop on into the interview with Kelly, though, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the patrons over on Patreon. So thank you so much, Annette of 513 Woodworks, Katie, Women in Woodworking, Kevin Lefty's Workshop, Christy Twisted Twine, Jeremy, Jeremy Spies, Sammy, Go Sammy Lee, Sven Dorsai's Workshop, Rachel Moody Makes, Bonnie Toolmom, Bonnie Toolmomstore.com, Laura Oakley Soap Company, Mary Lou made by Mary Lou, Brandy Studio, Obey, Lee, the Rainbow Carver, Carver, Ellen, Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan, Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you all so very much for your ongoing and continued support helping me to produce two episodes a week, every week. And with no further ado, here is Kelly. Well, I <laughs> I like to have my guests introduce themselves. So will you do that for me? Sure. Um, my name is Kelly Ketron, and I am the owner, mastermind, and handmaker behind Sally Ford Supply Company. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I live in Frederick, Maryland, but I consider Nashville, Tennessee to be my hometown. Okay, so. okay excellent. Um, I Before I start with my big question, I got to know, how'd you come up with the name for your business? Okay, so I really love etymology and um, listen to nerdy podcasts like Away With Words. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that, but basically they're like, how did, how did this word come about? Um, and I've had a lot of health issues in my life and a lot of traumatic experiences, unfortunately. And um, Sally Force Supply Company was the second name of my business. It started off as Dapper Geek, but we'll get to that later. Um, And there was a phrase that came across from, and so it started in the medieval times in uh, France, Sally, S-A-L-L-I-E, was used as, it was like um, an escape port from Mm -hmm. uh, fortresses and castles where people could either get in or out, but mostly they would escape the danger through the Sally um, ports and um, during World War One is when it became very popular and um, the phrase to sally forth uh, meant to leave so it was like trench warfare so you're in mm-hmm. your safe spot as safe as you can be and you know once you cross that field and you make forward momentum that it's worth the um, all the danger and um, fear to get there because you know you're moving towards a better place. So when I read about that, I just just blown away. So um, that felt like my experience Mm -hmm. and um, yeah. And then the supply company, because I didn't want to pigeonhole myself into being like in bags because (laughs) I want to make more than that. (laughs) So I had to be real conscientious about not doing that. Well, I really, I really like that. Thanks for explaining the the meaning behind that. Um, okay, so the big, big start question is, I want to know your, your story, like, you know, where, from where you were kind of where you grew up to how you got to where you are now. Okay. Okay. Um, it's a big story. It's hard to narrow it down. So please stop me if I ramble because I do not do anything briefly as anyone in my life will attest. Um, so, uh, born in Indiana, um, my mom joined the civil service, uh, when I was 12 and we moved to Germany, which was the best thing to happen because that's our town of 2000 people in Indiana. was very small. Um, 
And so we lived overseas, loved it. Um, unfortunately, we moved back in no offense, Oklahoma, but we moved from Germany to Oklahoma City, which was a huge culture shock um, and temperature. I mean, just the whole thing went from lush green trees to just flat. Right. <laughs> um, and um, so then my parents, when I graduated high school, I was 17 when I moved back. I was 12 when I moved to Germany. And my folks um, moved to Italy. They got uh, a new uh, uh, assignment there. And so I stayed in Oklahoma City for a year of community college. And I also played college soccer um, and rugby. And so I, was, I stayed around to, to finish out um, the scholarship. And I always loved music. Um, and so I was kind of looking, how could I get into the music industry, but I'm not a musician. And I found Middle Tennessee State University where I actually studied music business um, and got my degree and have a minor in business administration. Um, so I definitely wasn't on the path necessarily to do what I'm doing, except my mom does tell this story and I wish she would have taken a photo um, about when I was six and I was going to kindergarten and I came downstairs. Uh, my mom's a child development specialist to really clarify why she didn't take a photo. But um, she said, I came downstairs in my brother's three piece suit with my hair slicked back with a briefcase. And she was like, oh, hey, Kel, um, <laughs> who are you today? And I she said, I said very succinctly, I am a fashion designer. And I opened up my briefcase and I had some sort of six-year-old drawings it's probably just <laughs> coloring pages I'm not sure right and she said okay um and then she called the kindergarten teacher and said so just so you know Kelly's in her three-piece suit she's a fashion designer just a heads up <laughs> and uh, I asked her why she didn't take a photo and she said she didn't want me to feel like I was doing anything different <laughs> or that I was doing anything unique enough that she was going to document it, like making it into a, like a joke of some sort. So that was pretty cool. Um, okay, so back. So um, in college, when I was doing my degree, I started doing uh, stage lighting and design and wound up actually doing that for about nine years after I graduated. Um, nothing in the music industry <laughs> at all. It's like we all went to this with grand ideas. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of fell into doing um, sewing. My, I was always really good at it. Um, in home ec classes, somebody would be like, oh, let's make a pillow. And I'd make two pairs of boxer shorts. And, <laughs> uh, my teachers would, you know, they encouraged that and they, they kept, you know, teaching me different ways to do things. And I thought, okay, well, that's a cool skill to know. And did some cross stitch and embroidery here and there. Um, but I really didn't sew for myself until um, it was about 2013. I, um, I was managing a bar, a punk rock bar. So I guess there's a little music in there. Um, and unfortunately a customer assaulted me and um, he broke my collarbone and my shoulder and um, it kind of just changed everything at that moment. Um, and I was sitting at home and I was depressed and I was awaiting shoulder surgery and I didn't have income um, because unlike the movies, that these things take a long time to go to trial and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I was invited to go to a party and I wanted to wear a bow tie. At that point, I always wore uh, <laughs> sleeveless plaid shirts with ties. Um, I, was, I was like a greaser, punk rock, dapper person. <laughs> um, and I wanted to wear something different. So I went out and looked at some vintage stores and it was just all so overtly masculine or shiny mm -hmm. or big and they were so expensive and I was like you know I think I think I can make something so I went home that night and googled how do you make a bow tie <laughs> and um, I just happened to have the sewing machine that my mom made my brother and I's baby clothes with in the closet um, and a bag of fabric scraps I'm not even sure where they came from um, I probably made it out of an old curtain <laughs> and so I cut it up and I got the sewing machine out and managed to whip one up. And um, I wore it to the party. And that night, a bunch of people ordered them. <laughs> so um, 
I just try to come up with a name. Um, I always wore like uh, horn rim glasses. So um, Dapper Geek was the name of the company that was born um, out of that. So, Very yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, all of a sudden you grew a business started from a not so great situation. Um, <clears throat> yeah. It was one of those I needed to, I was either going to sink or I was going to swim. Mm-hmm. And I was determined to swim. <laughs> and I was going to find my happy somehow. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I mean, getting into stage design and then sewing and um, all of that. I mean, that's all hands-on making. Yeah. Did you do a lot of that as like a kid or a teenager as well? <laughs> Um, well, as a kid and teenager, um, as a kid, my mom um, would find me in my room uh, with Legos. I loved Legos. I loved building my dad's old erector set, anything my grandpa mm-hmm. teaching me to turn a uh, table leg in the garage, all those things. Um, totally different than what I do now, but my mom would find me in my room, um, like basically hot wiring um, Christmas lights together with uh, a D volt, like uh, nine volt batteries. Mm-hmm. And so I'd have these all intricately with electrical tape on all of them. And all the Lego houses had these lights. And I remember her being like, how did you, how did you know how to do this? It's like, I don't know. You, two plug, you know, you wire yeah. them together. And um, my stepdad and I were always building things and decks and pergolas. And, and then I got into uh, buying mopeds and, taught myself small engine repair thanks to YouTube. So I kind of like to do anything that involves making, especially Mm -hmm. construction. Uh. Hey makers. So today's podcast episode is sponsored in part by Alicia Van Osdahl, who is the owner of Basil Blue Design Company. Alicia is a maker of all things, really. Her focus is on beautiful craftsmanship through woodworking, repurposing, refinishing art and sculpture. Her background includes 30 years of graphic design, logos, and branding. If you have an idea or concept that and need a creative solution or graphic design, you can email Alicia directly at Alicia, and that is A-L-I-C-I-A at basilblue.com. Or you can visit her website at www.basilblue.com. And fun fact, uh, Alicia actually designed the logo for Crafting Revolution. So that is an example of the impeccable work you can expect if that is something you are in the market for. So be sure to look up Alicia again at her website, basilblue.com. All right, let's get back into the action. Yeah, I mean, so I guess I'm definitely really curious about, like, you've touched all these different types of making. (laughs) What is it about, like, sewing that keeps you going in that, you know, I guess in that direction? Right. Um, Well, there's something about taking a piece of floppy material and making it into, like, a rugged standalone you know, like a zipper box or bag. Um, I like the accessibility of fabric. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a lot of it around to be reused. Um, I like the versatility of it. I'm definitely not, I don't do what you do. I don't, I can't carve wood necessarily. I can't take away from things. I'm not a sculptor or, Mm -hmm. um, and I like um, textures and textiles a lot. I like loud fabrics so Mm -hmm. um something about combining two contrasting materials that makes it look really good Mm -hmm. i find it really cool um the whole idea of of even just and i'm not a garment maker at all but you know just like crisp lines and shoulders like those types of things and that meticulous um attention to detail um it's it's just always yeah i just love it uh, I think it also is a very tactile thing for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's all, I guess I should, I want to have you say like, what are all the things that you sew now? Cause I know you're beyond just bow ties. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's just so funny because once I got sick, I, 
I used to like dress to the nines and leather boots and fitted pants and waistcoats and ties. And um, that was not me anymore after I, you know, everything hurt. Um, and I'd always, so I, I went on a two and a half month um, road trip camping with my dogs. And this is kind of how I got into bag construction. And as I was traveling, I was, you know, hanging my solar shower up in a tree and I made, you know, and, and I realized that, you know, dock kits or toiletry bags all sit flat and they're boring and they're black and vinyl or leather. And, mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to make a bag that could hang up. <laughs> and so it was just like very simple things that I, I learned how to do. And so I made a hanging bag and then somebody said, well, if you put another strap on it, that's longer, it can become a bike bag. It's like, okay. So it's just kind of snowballing into these, these things and different items that I make, but I, I do uh, bags, bike bags, um, wax canvas aprons, uh, do a lot of custom of those. Um, I make a chapstick wallet. Um, it's a, it's a little like, rectangular wallet with a pearl snap and a piece of elastic on it that you hold your chapstick with. Um, I had a friend in college who always made a slate because she was looking for chapstick, excuse <laughs> me, in her ID. And I had the tie materials at the time and I was putting pearl snaps on all my shirts to keep my whole greaser thing up. And mm -hmm. um, so I made a wallet. I was like, well, this is cool. Um, and that's been just a fun thing to do it also is a good way to use scraps mm -hmm. try to use up as much as possible um what else do I make I still sometimes would do the ties for certain people or certain events um and just a bunch of different bags um I always try out different sizes I'm trying to um figure out um a few designs I'm going to be expanding but I've been trying to focus on um accessibility items for people. I do a lot of hiking and um, the summer is really bad for my, um, my health. And so I'm trying to come up with different ways uh, to package like cold uh, bandanas and small little cases so that people like me, we can put it in there when we leave and then it stays, we can rotate things out, things like that. I'm trying to develop and move more into besides just these bags, but something that's a little bit more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're all self-taught on it, right? On yeah. all of the sewing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I watch a lot of videos, but mostly it's just trial and error. Uh, most of my friends have some sort of wonky bag or weird thing that fits, you know, a deck of cards and that's it. But <laughs> Um, where are you, yeah, how are you sourcing your material? Um, I try to buy American made when possible and support, um, local artists. I, um, all my canvas is, uh, American made, American sourced. Um, I try to buy any sort of parts and pieces that I can that are produced here. Um, Kind of depends. I've had people that have had their, you know, grandmas die and they bring me a big box of fabric because that they have this mm -hmm. cool stuff and that, that they found. Um, I try to repurpose as much as possible. Um, it's just fun. I, you know, somebody gave me these um, old bank bags that you see in a movie that people fill up with cash and throw right. it over their shoulder. And uh, it was, I think her uncle's and so she sent me these like five amazing 1970s bank bags that I'm going to make something awesome out of. And so it's, it's kind of a community effort. Um, we have a big maker community where I live, where it's a lot of exchanges of, of things like, Oh, you're looking for this one. Well, I've got this. And uh, that's, so, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, I had, I had somebody in my, area wanting to actually like set up kind of like a Facebook group for like makers to post like stuff that they have that they you know material wise that they're like not using um as kind of like a trade system of like okay I've That's got cool. these yeah. you know and it's it's a cool idea um it definitely will take effort to get it um working <laughs> and getting makers to know that it's there um, 
I like what you said about the the like you know somebody's grandma died or whatever in a big box of of scraps like my great grandma was a quilter and I remember um after she died like you know we were going through all the stuff in the house and part of it was like I don't even know I think there was still like 50 completed quilts like in her closet that she had wow. that she hadn't gotten a chance to like you know give out yet because she had um she had six kids and I can't even remember like oh, wow. I don't I think like 19 grandkids and then like 50 great grandkids or something crazy wow so you have a big family yeah but she like I mean she made a quilt for everybody like everybody and I have you know multiple I've got like bed quilts and then I've got just like um throws quilted throws for like the couch and stuff but I also remember it's like besides the completed stuff there was just like boxes and boxes of material you know scraps that were there waiting for her to continue to make more quilts and so it would be cool to think like that got to go to somebody else and they could make something like special out of it whether it was to sell or to um you know give to their their family members yeah yeah does your does your a lot it is (laughs) How are you, how are you keeping them safe or, or Um, what are you doing with them right now? Yeah. So like, I didn't, I didn't get to keep any, like, I didn't take any of the scraps. I think like my, my grandma and her siblings, you know, figured out where to take that stuff to, but all of my quilts and stuff are just, I mean, they're in good condition, really good condition, but it's, it's one of those things that still makes me happy to like see my kids like cuddled up. And like, oh, a, yeah. you know, a throw that I was cuddled up in at their age and they're like still cuddled up in the, uh, you know, on the couch in it. It's just, it's something that's really cool. I don't think besides like passing down furniture, I think that like that textile stuff that gets passed down, those are like the two things that get passed down through families. Right. And they're, yeah, I think there's just something special about that that people don't always necessarily connect, don't think about, you know? Right. And it tells so much of a story too, because you can tell the age by the prints, you can tell who it was made for by the color scheme. And Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've tried to quilt before and it's, I really respect it. I'm not the best at it. (laughs) Um, It blows my mind just how they sew the corners. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I've tried. Um, my family, they weren't quilters. They made Afghans. So mm-hmm. I've got piles of Afghans, but <clears throat> unfortunately, most of them are very 70s, 80s yeah. colors. So it's yeah. a lot of browns and yellows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. That's, the, that's the, with that quality, you know, when you make yeah. something out of good material and, and um, it lasts for generations. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Revolution Pod Squad. This week's episode is brought to you in part by myself, your host, Katie Freeman. And I want to bring you some super exciting news. Uh, The fact that I am going to be releasing my very first virtual training. It is about how to add bright, bold, beautiful colors to your woodworking pieces. It's called Woodstain Rockstar. Super excited to be bringing it to you and super excited to get to interact with people in a new way for me. Um, I've taught classes in person, but this is the first time doing classes virtually. So super excited about that. And I think If you want to learn how to add some really crazy color to your work pieces, just like I do, then head on over to freemanfurnishings.com right there on the homepage, scroll down to the bottom, and you can sign up for the wait list of the classes and you will get the link as soon as the class is live. And that also gets you an additional 10% off as well for the very first low introductory price. So hope to see you over there on the wait list so you can join me for this class and all the classes to come. All right, let's hop right back in into the episode. Yeah, I, I also have a ton of Afghans because then my, um, my grandma didn't do, oh, I'm so gonna mess this up. She's not a knitter. What is she? 
what's the other yarn crochet uh, crochet yeah so she yeah. would she crocheted a bunch of um afghans too so i have that from her quilts from her mother um and then my mother wow. my mother-in-law knits and so my kids have all i mean we're set for life in the blanket department <laughs> for sure. <laughs> You'll always be warm. Exactly. <laughs> and to the point that our animals even have like their favorite blankets, right? That like <laughs> yeah, out. yeah. Um, what is um, when you're sourcing your material? How do you feel like you like? can help maintain that story of like where it came from down to what it becomes. I, uh, I love to do pop-up shows because I think that talking to people one-on-one -on -one, um, is important for stories like that. Um, and I have a very open dialogue on everything. I'm pretty um, trans, like I want transparency for everything. Um, and it's been fun. Like somebody will try on a tie and I'll be like, well, let me tell you the story about where that came from. Um, and when I try to do write-ups about things or I do my Instagram posts, if there's an attachment to that fabric or a story behind it, um, I want to include that. Um, yeah. I, I just, I don't know. I, I just love talking about it. That's the hard thing is that I know that I need to do more video I'm just not a great content maker. The best I can do is when I do waxing videos and then people love them, but I, I'm not having to entertain or try to video edit. Um, and I know I need to get better about it to continue that. And it's funny because when I tell people about the story of Sally Forth, they just they go, oh, well, I just thought that that was your name. It's like, oh man, I really got to get better about this. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to talk about it enough. So right. those are things that I struggle with um, as a business owner of being the, you know, the sole person mm -hmm. here trying to keep up with all those fronts. I guess um, this is a question I like to I like to ask sometimes about like is it necessary really to grow your business to get good at content no no i think it's apples and oranges um mm -hmm. i it's funny because i'm an introverted extrovert and everyone thinks that i'm really outgoing but internally i'm like oh god <laughs> to be judged on this or that it's like oh that angle isn't very flattering where I need to just be like well screw it I I'm focusing mm -hmm. on my or uh, people should be focusing on my what I'm making not necessarily what I look like mm -hmm. um so you know there's some self-conscious things there when it comes to putting out that content but no I mean I don't think that you have to grow in order to be more connected I work in a local uh, handmade shop downtown Frederick part-time and um places like ours and, and places that sell American or handmade places that that talk about the makers and talk about the process. I think that it's a big community effort mm -hmm. um, for makers to promote each other yep. as much as possible to try to, yeah. And I mean, the reality is, is creating content, especially doing it well, is a full-time job. Um, I mean, you do it well. You've got your dancing videos and stuff. It's like, I need to find a thing besides just melting wax. <laughs> I mean, well, people love it, but. Uh. I'm going to tell you the dancing videos is relatively new. And I mean, yeah, I, I really, truly still do not understand why so many people enjoy them, but I will continue to do them because I have fun with them. Um, right. But but, you know, and I think I, I know I posted, I don't know how long ago it was, but just a, a few posts ago about like, I was doing recordings for the virtual trainings that I'm putting together and like the mess ups. And it's like, that's yeah. the reality behind it. Like to right. get, to get, you know, 20 minutes of good video, it took me four hours and oh, several, yeah. <laughs> and several takes, you know? Um, yeah. And, and that was just the recording. It, that's not the editing side to get, you know, what I needed to get out of it. But, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, and doing all of that 
actually has nothing to do with my making. Like right. my making is, you know, um, uh, one of the reasons I like it is it because it's just me and whatever I'm working on. Um, yeah. And so it can, it takes time to learn how to bring people into that um, right. in a way that they can connect with. Um, you know, I mean, I've been on, I've been trying to create content and make that into a thing for four years, four plus years now. And, and it's, yeah. it's still not a thing, not a thing that can sustain me, you know? <laughs> right. So, right. So that's where it's like, uh, I, I want to yeah. ask that question about like, it sounds like you have a good functioning business, just making and selling. And, right. And is the content needed or is it something that it's like you find it enjoyable because of the community? Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's great that we bring awareness that as makers, we're not just doing our making, but we're also our social media, we're our business managers, we feel the calls, we have to create basically a commercial every mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. in order to keep people interested. Um, for me, um, I think that because I'm a disabled maker, that the more representation that I can give, the more, I don't know, the more that I can give back to my community to show like, you know, and I don't just show the good days. Like I talk about the bad days. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, it's bonding with the community. Um, and just educating about certain topics and things. Um, no, it's not necessary. People like it. And I, I like when people are like, oh, good job. I mean, we all like the accolades. Right, right, um, right. So it's kind of selfish in a way uh, when, we, when we're like, oh, hey, watch me do this thing. Um, but I mean, what we're doing is cool. So why right. wouldn't we, you know, why wouldn't we want to share it with everybody? Do you, do you feel then like a you know, about bringing up being a disabled maker, do you, do you feel a sort of responsibility about being that representation? I feel the responsibility to use the platform that I have. Um, I mean, my Instagram and social media isn't necessarily curated um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like some folks um, because it does wax and wane depending on how I'm feeling or what I'm going through. Um, I don't feel a need. I feel like, I mean, here's a good example. So this is yesterday and, and I posted about it on my Facebook and everybody was like, you should tell the story. Um, but I'm not going to name any names. So this young lady came into the shop yesterday and I walk with a cane um, because I have chronic vertigo due to a nerve that died in my inner ear a couple of years ago. And she was carrying this cane that I call like the disability startup kit, which is what you get in the hospital. It's just black. It's got a sponge handle. We all have seen somebody with it. Um, and she was with two other friends. They were probably 19 and under. And she was saying there were shaky legs and she was holding this cane that looked like it had never been used. And I don't know what it was, but for some reason, I felt like I needed to come around the corner and walk out into my floor space and use my cane. Mm -hmm. And I did my thing and I came back behind and like two minutes later, she came up to me and she said, I don't know if you knew how much I needed to see you use that cane. And I was like, okay. I said, well, I saw that you had one and, and you kind of, you know, your sh legs are shaking. And, and I, and I was like, you know, I, I, it seemed like it was new to you. And, and she said she got real serious and she said, does, does it get better? Does it get easier? And I said, well, you know, you learn to deal with it and you learn, um, you learn different ways to, uh, to, I don't know, there's a confidence that you have to <laughs> pretend to have mm -hmm. until you develop it about, Hey, I've got this stick but I'm still kick ass. I'm still going to do my thing. And I talked about hiking and my hiking sticks and my hiking poles and told her about it. I don't know. I'm very, retelling this very poorly, but um, basically it was, you know, she has a condition that'll be for life. And 
and she looked so glum when she came in. And um, after telling her about resources and things that I, I'm able to do, she actually cheered on her way out and talked about how grateful she was that she happened to come into our store that day. And, and I think that being honest about the hardships and uh, the way it feels to be visibly different um, is important because I think that hopefully I helped her get a few more uh, months into her confidence. I mean, shoot, they let her go and they didn't even show her how to use it. Like I walked right. around the store with her. We, you know, um, it's just like, you know, I hope, you know, I hope that I am the person that I would have needed at that time. And I, I feel uh, a big, calling to be that advocate and to be the person that um, can show people that what can be done and then what mm -hmm. it looks like when you just can't even get out of bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey makers, today's episode is sponsored in part by toolmomstore.com. At toolmomstore.com you can find any and all tool-based merchandise for all genders, all sizes. They've got mugs, they've got shirts, all kinds of cool stuff. I have uh, one of the shirts myself that has the uh, hashtag woodworker on it. And I also have a couple of the mugs that define what and who is a tool chick. So super excited with the merchandise that I have. I know that you will be satisfied as well. Um, and also, great discount for those of you who listen to the podcast at checkout if you enter the code maker mom you will get a 20 percent discount off any of the merchandise that you buy so that's just toolmomstore.com all right let's head back into the action i mean i think you know it that you've listened to the the podcast a bit i think you probably understand that i'm a big advocate of representation matters um yep across everything <laughs> um, yeah. pretty much um and so i do think i guess i, I just want to i guess say i guess thank you for accepting that responsibility in the sense that like it's tech i mean you don't owe it necessarily to anybody right, right. to to do that um but i do think it's helpful to others um in any community but uh, but in the maker community because i do think there's also a little bit of lack of accessibility to some yes. avenues of making right like yep. i think in the woodworking world like things like table saws and stuff like that aren't necessarily right. made accessible um right you know um everybody's expected to conform uh to yeah. some standard that somebody set at some point in time for that right <laughs> right and it, it's funny because she didn't even know like there's parking things like in in our downtown area you can park for free for four hours with your handicap plaque it was like the things, and I had to learn, I had a social worker, I've been fighting mm -hmm. my illness for, you know, for over four years now. Um, and working downtown, as far as I know, I am the only mobility challenged employee, the whole downtown area. And when I had to use, start using the cane, because I also have um, lupus and RA, uh, which heat and cold can really zap me too. And so I had to go to the downtown partnership and I was like look I work downtown I need to be able to park close what do we have to do and um, my boss and myself went to bat and we had a lot of people um, with the partnership that had my back and made it so that I can park for eight hours whenever mm -hmm. I need when I'm working um, and people don't think about these things you know and even when you know they shut down streets for festivals like you know mm -hmm. where where are mobility challenge people or elderly where are they supposed to go um yeah. and it's the same with like the sewing world too i mean to cut fabric alone to either use shears or to use a rotary cutter i mean these things are all 
planned for, you know, uh, abled people, abled body people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't think about that kind of stuff until you, you come across. And I think it's important to bring these issues up. Mm-hmm. Is a table saw. I can't even imagine trying to operate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mean, I yeah. mean, I know people do it and it blows my mind, but wow. Like, I mean, I guess an example I know of is um, I, I had um, a person who worked with me for a short period of time as an apprentice and um, their father was, had been a, a woodworker for years as, as a hobby um, but he, um, developed Parkinson's, you know, and what? he can, he continued to woodwork and basically until he just, he couldn't anymore. He was, he wow. was too, too shaky. Um, but they talked about how hard that was, uh, to watch their father go through basically having to give up something that he deeply loved, um, because he just, he, he couldn't safely right. do it any longer um and you know i've been on this path of uh of power tools and how they function or don't function for people who, uh, <laughs> of of smaller stature like uh women yeah. uh non-binary folks but um i'm really glad to have this conversation with you because Unfortunately, I guess my able-bodiedness uh, is showing in that I wasn't thinking about like how to also make it more accessible for those um, who you know have some some physical disability. Um, so yeah. I appreciate this conversation a <laughs> lot. It will make me think. More. Yeah, and I've been called. I mean, I felt the calling to be an advocate. Ever since that, so, and then when I got sick, is like you know, how can I survive this? And there was, I'm gonna own it. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started getting sick, I had these tremors that were very obvious, and um, I had my dog Charlie who passed right before Christmas. But he, I found him when he was a baby, and when I started having these like tremor seizures, he would just lay on parts of my body, and then when I started to get back into the public eye. Um, I would have like walking blackouts. And so I had him, he, he and I just figured out how to work together. And it was really hard to have a dog wearing, you know, a service dog vest and to be that obvious. And Mm -hmm. I felt, um, I mean, not only do I look differently anyway, um, I'm very clearly gay, (laughs) Uh, but to then also be in this new town and have you know, a dog that said that, and I had a really hard time. And I talked to a therapist about it and I was like, you know, I, I need to do this. I feel better with him, but how can I own it? And I just, I made the decision then and there that I was just going to be an advocate. I was going to tell everybody about how to do it. I was going to tell them why, um, and learn as much as I could to be able to be kind of, uh, my, my friend Courtney calls me my a community center, <laughs> my own community center. Um, but I think that it's important. I, I, I want to make sure that people have the access or at least know about as much as I can share. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I keep trying to learn, um, there's a bunch of hiking groups. Like I just started following disabled hikers and her, her stuff is just incredibly informative. Um, I've learned a lot of, of things that, you know, not about sewing, but about different ways to, you know, still maintain some sort of balance. Of, yep. of things that you love and make it work for for what you are able to do yeah so I mean I know like you talked about you share like about your your bad days as well on like Instagram and stuff um I think you've got a gold mine of information to to your point of being like your own community center type thing <laughs> of of um being able to share how have you had to um what adjustments have you had to make to your making to sewing uh, oh because gosh of your because of, yeah you know uh disabilities i think that would probably be something that a lot of 
people would interact with uh, content wise to see, yeah. just like you talked about walking with the cane, you know, for that right um, young lady, but like how, how do you cut up material, you know, based on what's going on for you that day type of thing. Right. I think you've just started up the, the <laughs> podcast. I've always wanted to start at that point. <laughs> um, well, it's just interesting because um, so I have my hands are affected and my elbows really bad with my rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so I've had to learn to, to, you know, switch scissors. I have a multitude of different types and different weights um, and things like, like in, the, you can't, schedule something in concrete like you can't make a concrete plan because and if you do you have to allow yourself the grace right. to and the the ability to reach out to your client and say you know and I'm always up front I mean like if anybody looked at my Instagram they would know and just say you know having a really bad time it just may be a couple of days later um when I was in when my nerve my inner ear died I had a big apron order for a local um, deli and I had a friend so I couldn't um, stand up straight um, I was basically falling backwards and to the left I couldn't read I had a massive headache um, couldn't even sit upright and I had a friend <laughs> sneak my sewing machine which it's a 55 pound industrial Ken, 1959 Kenmore sewing machine in with a suitcase <laughs> <laughs> into my room because I needed to make two more aprons because they had a soft opening and I, I had to do this. And I remember setting it up and my friend brought all the material and like propped up in this chair and I couldn't really focus very well. I was like, damn it, I'm going to do this. And the nurse came in and was like, what are you doing? I, said, I just need like an hour. She said, you get 30 minutes and then you have to take an hour break. And so my friend sat there and um, then delivered these aprons for me. And, um, and then it was uh, probably six weeks after that before I was able to sew because then unfortunately my, my issues became where I had, I have problems reading now. And um, I, my eyes uh, get, what all I can explain is like a static feedback. If I, if I try to read lines of, and so, Sometimes when I try to sew um, different patterns will cause this feedback and I've just had to learn to walk away, <laughs> which is really hard for me because when I get frustrated, I always want to push through and then make more mistakes. Right. Um, so trying to learn boundaries and balance. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm my biggest critic and I'm the hardest on myself, but um, trying to learn that point where you should just walk away. Um, and then, you know, just like brain breaks, things that you're supposed right. to do when your, your neurological situation gets out of control. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, that would be interesting to kind of try to talk about exactly what I do for that. But um, yeah, when it's cold, I wear fingerless gloves for my fingers. And when it's hot, I have a, a cooling vest that I put on so that I can stay my temperature regulated. I think it's mostly about taking care of your body first. And unfortunately you have to put the business second. Um, yep. But I think being very open with clients um, is important. And I've yet to have an issue with anybody when I have been hundred percent honest from the get go, but. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, well, I am like paying like hawk attention to the, to the time. So I, oh. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time, but I want to give you a chance to let people know, like, how can they find you and follow along with you? Yeah, um, my website is sallyforthsupplyco.com. Uh, my Instagram is at sallyforthsupplyco. Um, I'm also on Facebook, but I don't do a lot on there. I'm working on my TikTok. I have one. It's um, intrepid, I-N-T-R-E-P-I-D underscore explorer, which there's a funny story with that. But um, <laughs> yeah, and hopefully I'll get a YouTube going soon. It's on my to-do list, but unfortunately, this body's not reacting properly. It takes a little bit more time, but yeah. Yep. yep. Well, yeah, I'm glad to be able to do this. Sorry if I yeah. talked. No, 
chatted too much. I told you I'm never brief. (laughs) No, you're good. Um, But thanks for chatting with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. So again, that was Kelly of Sally Forth Supply Company, and I'll include the link on how you can follow along with her in the show notes for today's episode. So you can find that in the description of the episode on whatever podcast app you're listening to this on, or if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, check the description down below there as well. Now, if you would like to get your name added to this to the list at the start of the episode, make sure you head on over to patreon.com forward slash crafting a revolution and you can join the pod squad right then and there and get your name uh, mentioned at the start of the episode for every episode every week. Also, if you enjoyed today's episode and any of the other episodes, please make sure that you hit subscribe on your podcast app and also head on over to iTunes, leave a five-star review. Most importantly, though, like the biggest, biggest thing you can do is to share about the podcast with a couple of people who don't already know about it. Share with your friends. I'm really striving to try to hit the 10,000 downloads per month. Right now we're sitting about 2,500 downloads per month. So I need your help, Pod Squad, to make this happen. Help us reach that 10,000 downloads a month. And once we do, if we get a 10,000 download month, then I will make sure that a live event happens for a live podcast episode and get Ashley Minnie's butt there to do a live uh, performance of the theme song for the epi- for the podcast. So that should be a huge incentive all on its own. So help us do this pod squad. All right. When I am not interviewing and making podcast episodes, you can find me designing and making furniture and other home decor at freemanfurnishings.com and at Freeman Furnishings pretty much across all social media. All right, so it's Wednesday, halfway through our week. I hope you are having a fantastic week so far. And as always, let's go out and craft a revolution. She, her, them, they got something they want to say. Solution for the toxic masculinity. Pollution is the constant.